thank you very much. Uh, I'm just going to attempt to share my screen. Great. So, God rules in the kingdom of men. It's quite a statement, isn't it? Um, and I'm sure you would look at me and say, what would cause you to make such a bold claim? Well, today we're going to try and take some first steps into understanding what the Bible teaches about this subject. And by doing so, we hope to interest you in the overall message of this amazing book. But before we examine any part of the Bible, first, we must acknowledge the facts we see around us. It's very easy to observe the kingdoms of and the nations of the world uh, and that they're ruled over by men and women, many of whom do not even claim to believe in a God. And even if they do, their rulership usually leads to actions that seem at variance with the teachings of most world religions. And this feels more true than ever as we've watched in horror the terrible unfolding of Russia's invasion of neighbouring Ukraine. And it's understandable if we're struggling to see why a loving God is allowing the devastating warfare which is inflicting so much destruction and suffering. In the face of such heartbreaking scenes, how can I make such a bold and seemingly contradictory claim in the face of this evidence? The claim that, in fact, God rules in the kingdom of men. Well, let's be clear from the start. This is not my claim. These are words recorded in the Bible, the book that declares itself to be the inspired word of God, a divine and unique message to mankind. And here are some passages you may want to look at later that support that claim and challenge us to accept this book's authority. If we are prepared to accept that the Bible is from God and is the only source of his true teaching, then it has many fascinating claims that can greatly impact our lives. And a key one is declared from the very opening page of the Bible. This is the key claim that God is the creator. We find this recorded in the first book of the Bible in its opening declaration. And thus we read in Genesis 1 verse 1 these words. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Later, about halfway through our Bibles, we find this statement about God made by a faithful man called Jeremiah in the book named after him. He has made the earth by his power, says Jeremiah. He has established the world by his wisdom and has stretched out the heavens at his discretion. And in the final book of the Bible, the same consistent message is delivered. So we read in Revelation chapter four, you are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things. And by your will, they exist and were created. So this can lead us to our first step in understanding and our first conclusion. The Bible repeatedly teaches that God is the creator. It encourages us to come to understand and accept that God created this planet, as well as all the amazing life upon it, including mankind. And if this is the case, then we must also acknowledge God's right to do with his creation as he sees fit. And this leads us to our next key claim, that God has ultimate dominion. Now, this may seem an old fashioned word, but it does summarize, encapsulate the, the ideas of possession, control and rulership that the Bible states in different ways. So an example it, we can read in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul makes this claim in Acts 17. God, who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands. And then back in the Old Testament, in the poetical writings, we read the famous King David making this statement in Psalm 24. The earth is the Lord's 
and all its fullness, the world and those who dwell therein. And David repeats this idea in the historic section of the Old Testament as part of a coronation prayer that he makes for his son Solomon. It's recorded in 1 Chronicles 29. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory, the victory and the majesty. For all that is in heaven and in earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord. And you are exalted as head over all. So now we can see a second conclusion that as the creator, the earth and all its inhabitants belong to God. He is described as both the Lord and king over all. And there's that phrase ahead over all. So it should not surprise us to think of God as ruling over his creation. But why did God create the earth and life upon it? What was the point? Well, here is um, our next claim, that God has a purpose. These words form a future prophecy in the book of Habakkuk, where God says, For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And again, if we turn to the end of the Bible, we read this, in, as we've already done so in Revelation 4. Remember what it said, you are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honour and power, for you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. And then we can think about Jesus and his teachings. He, he brought this idea in what we often refer to as the Lord's Prayer. It's in Matthew 6 where he starts the prayer, in this manner, therefore, pray, O Father, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So here's uh, our third conclusion. And God created the earth with a purpose in mind. And this purpose is revealed through different statements. Firstly, that the earth should be filled with the knowledge of God's glory. Then we're told that all things were created by God's will. And also there is this idea that there is need for God's will to be done on earth, as it's actually done in heaven. And we might note that the future tense is often used when describing God's purpose. This is because God's purpose with his creation is yet to be completely fulfilled. If you think about it, the earth now is not filled with the knowledge of God's glory. In fact, many no longer believe in God, let alone understand and know his glory. And nor can we imagine that God finds pleasure in all his creation, which was brought into being by his will. Much of this beautiful planet is ravaged by pollution. Ex exploitation, overpopulation, violence, and we could go on with that list, most of which, if we stop and think about it, is a result of mankind. And when we then think about that, this is because God's will is not done on the earth by the majority of humanity. Even those who do try to obey God's teachings will openly acknowledge they fail spectacularly the majority of the time. So why, we might ask, if God created the earth, if he rules over it, and if he has a purpose for it, why does this planet seem to be in such a mess? Surely the state of the world is evidence against God's control, some might say. This leads us to our next claim that man was made in God's image and given dominion. Now, this idea is clear, again, from the first chapter of the Bible. So we can read this in Genesis 1, another summary, if you like, of God's purpose. Then the Lord said, let us make a man, sorry, let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea 
over the birds of the air and over the cattle, over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Later in history, King David would reflect on the same purpose through these poetic words in Psalm 8. What is man that you are mindful of him? And the son of man that you visit him. For you've made him a little lower than the angels and have crowned him with glory and honor. You have made him to have dominion over the works of your hands. You've put all things under his feet. So here's another conclusion we might reach. The Bible teaches that mankind is unique in all God's creation. We were created to be in God's image and likeness. So we were intended to be like him. In character, in desire, in purpose. And we might note that God chose to give mankind dominion over his creation too. But what do we think God wanted us to do with that dominion? Were we supposed to lord it over creation? abusing the power given us to exploit and to cause harm? Or were we intended to love creation, seeing it as a gift from God and therefore cherishing and caring for it? Does dominion mean despotic rulership or does it mean responsible stewardship? Having been made to be in God's image and likeness, God did not make humans as automatons. He gave us the ability to make our own decisions, just as he, the creator, makes choices. And we might refer to this as we will. <laughs> Sorry. The problem is that humans have always failed to consistently match their free will to God's will. And that leads us to the next claim that man uses his free will to go against God. And we can see this indicated in the Old Testament. And here's an example in this divine appeal recorded in Isaiah 55. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord and he will have mercy on him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Now in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul quotes again from the Old Testament to prove this same point to fellow believers in Romans chapter 3. <laughs> So he says, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. They've all turned aside. They have together become unprofitable. There is none who does good, no, not one. And then he adds his own summary to this. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So our, our next conclusion is that the Bible consistently teaches that humans have failed to keep up to God's original intention for them. We consistently make ungodly choices and need to be called back to God's ways and thoughts. When we are not choosing to be in God's image and likeness, we're described by words like wicked or unrighteous or unprofitable. And it's said that we have sinned and fallen short of God's glorious intentions for us. This is a huge problem then. God gave us dominion over his creation, but our rulership is ultimately flawed. And this is because we use our free will to go against God and his purpose, whether we mean to or not. This falling short of God's intended purpose is summarised by the Bible language, all have sinned. 
But now we come to that great claim that we started with. God rules in the kingdom of man. And this is vital because it declares to us that God has not forsaken his creation, nor has he given up on mankind. And he certainly intends to fulfill his purpose upon the earth. So the Bible also teaches us that God is working to direct events to fulfill his purpose. And God chose to reveal this in particular detail to a specific world leader, King Nebuchadnezzar, who ruled over the superpower of his day, which was the empire of Babylon. God gave Nebuchadnezzar special visions of the future, which were interpreted for him by one of God's prophets, the man Daniel. And it's in the book of Daniel that our title phrase is used, God rules in the kingdom of men. And perhaps it's this book, more than any other in the Bible, that shows how God is at work in the nations. Just an example in Daniel 2, where we read, Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. And he changes the times and the seasons. He removes kings and raises up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. So here, Daniel clearly states that God works behind the scenes, that he's changing significant times and events. And these, in turn, lead to changes in rulership amongst men's nations. And this is then proved to Nebuchadnezzar, who's one of these kings, through a God-given dream of a mighty statue. Now, this dream was of the image of a man standing, but this image was made up of different metals for different parts of its body. As the dream progressed, the statue was eventually toppled and destroyed by a stone, which then replaced it, in fact, and grew into a mountain, filling the whole earth. Chapter 2 of Daniel also records the God-given interpretation of this imagery, revealing to Nebuchadnezzar that in time, his own kingdom would be taken over by another, and that there would in fact be a succession of empires. But it's important to note that these empires are represented by this single statue. In other words, all these empires represented a single idea, the kingdom of men. Describing these empires using the singular kingdom rather than the plural word kingdoms reveals God's perspective. From the creator's point of view, man has been given dominion, but unless we do God's will, whoever is ruling, whoever is represented by this one single image, it's always seen as the kingdom of men. However, this amazing prophecy reveals that eventually after a series of human empires, change would come. And the kingdom of men would eventually be toppled by that stone that would grow into a mountain that would fill the earth. Later in the chapter, Daniel explains the meaning behind this God-given dream, as we read in verses 37 to 38. You, O king, are a king of kings, for the God of heaven has given you a kingdom, power, strength and glory. And wherever the children of men dwell or the beasts of the field and the birds of the heaven, he has given them into your hand and has made you ruler over them all. You are this head of gold. So Nebuchadnezzar needed to understand that his dominion had been gifted to him by the one true God, and that he had a responsibility in how he used that power. But more than that, he needed to understand that his kingdom and every other kingdom created by man would eventually come to an end. This is very evident 
from the powerful imagery seen in the dream. And Daniel explains in verse 44 to 45 that this imagery represents a change in the world order. And in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Inasmuch as you saw that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it broke in pieces, the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver and the gold, the great God has made known to the king what will come to pass after this. The dream is certain, and its interpretation is sure. Nebuchadnezzar had received a prophecy of the future. God could reveal this to him because God rules in the kingdom of men. And it is God who is ultimately directing history so that his purpose can be fulfilled at last. This purpose will be fulfilled when God's kingdom can finally replace the flawed rulership that sinful men and women exercise over his creation. Sadly, Nebuchadnezzar soon forgot these powerful lessons, but God continued to reveal things to him in an attempt to help him understand the truth. So in Daniel chapter four, we read that Nebuchadnezzar revealed a second vision, this time of a mighty tree that was cut down and left as a stump. At the end of the vision, Nebuchadnezzar was told its purpose. This decision is by the decree of the watchers and the sentence by the word of the holy ones in order that the living may know that the most high rules in the kingdom of men and gives it to whomever he will and sets over it the lowest of men. When Daniel interprets this vision for Nebuchadnezzar, he reveals a warning that it is If this mighty king forgot that it was God who was ultimately in control, he would be cut down like the tree. He, Nebuchadnezzar, would be left like a stump until he remembered who had given him that power and how that power should be used to reflect the rulership of God, which is righteous and merciful. Sadly, Nebuchadnezzar had to learn the hard way, as we so often do. His pride got the better of him, and he took all the glory for his empire, as described in verse 30 of this chapter. And he forgot to give God the glory. And it's at this point that we read that he was reduced to a beast-like state and lost his rulership. However, the narrative continues, and a time came when he again recognised the ultimate truth. And we read that in verses 34 and 37. It says, and at that time, sorry, and at the end of the time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven, and my understanding returned to me. And I blessed the Most High and praised and honoured him who lives forever. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion. And his kingdom is from generation to generation. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honour the king of heaven, all whose works are truth and his ways justice. And those who walk in pride, he is able to put down. Nebuchadnezzar was given a powerful, personal reminder that God ruled in the kingdom of Babylon, despite Nebuchadnezzar falling into the trap of thinking that he was the ultimate ruler. And the same is true for all the world's leaders. They may be under the illusion that they hold the power in their countries, but God makes it clear in the Bible, especially in the book of Daniel, that he is the one who can raise up leaders and bring them down again, And this depends on how God's purpose is to be moved forward. Now, if the all-powerful God was as intimately at work in Nebuchadnezzar's life, then we can be sure that he's able to work in our lives just as intimately. And this should humble us, as it eventually humbled the mighty king of the empire of Babylon. Further examples are evident throughout the Bible. Just to reinforce the point, I'm going to consider 
three further passages quickly. So in Jeremiah 25, for example, we read this. Therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, because you have not heard my words, behold, I will send and take all the families of the north, says the Lord, and Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant, and will bring them against this land, against its inhabitants and against these nations all around, and will utterly destroy them and make them an astonishment, a hissing and perpetual desolations. And here, one of God's messengers, the prophet Jeremiah, has to tell the nation of Judah that Nebuchadnezzar was being sent to invade their land because they failed to hear God's repeated call to them to be in his image and likeness. We should note that God, in this passage, calls the king of Babylon, my servant. And this was because God was really the ruler in the kingdom of men and was controlling events to use Babylon's empire building as a way to discipline God's own special nation. So Nebuchadnezzar was serving the Lord's will and purpose. But another prophecy, this time through Isaiah, tells of another time when God would use another mighty ruler, Cyrus the Persian. And we read in Isaiah 45, and thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have held, to subdue nations before him and loose the armour of kings. For Jacob, my servant's sake, and Israel, my elect, I have even called you by your name. I have named you, though you have not known me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. There is no God beside me. I will go to you, though you have not known me. So note again that even though Cyrus knew nothing of the one true God, he was anointed and named so that God would continue working out his purpose with the nation of Israel. In this case, Cyrus would end the captivity of the Jews that Nebuchadnezzar had imposed, what we read in the, the passage before. And Cyrus would allow them to return to their homeland from which they'd been taken away. And those things were all according to God's promise. The final example for now comes from the New Testament part of our Bible and a letter written to Christian believers by the Apostle Paul. Now, despite them living under the rule of the pagan Roman Empire, Paul explains that they should accept this. And in Romans 13, he states this. Let every soul be subject to the governing authority. For there is no authority except from God. And the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God. And those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. So part of his explanation about Christian behavior rests on the clear assertion that God was still ruling in the kingdom of men and was appointing those who ruled over them. Now, if this was true in the first century AD in the Roman Empire and hundreds of years earlier in the Babylonian and Persian empires, then it must also be true now as God continues to rule over his creation. But what does all this mean for us? We've taken some first steps seeking to explore the Bible's overall message, but what might we have learned? Well, the world is in an awful state. And when we look at those who rule over the nations of the world now, we may fear that there is no hope, no future. But we should find comfort from what the Bible reveals. God is in ultimate control. We, we may not always understand the how and the why, but God is directing events and leaders in this world. And the reason for all this is so that his purpose might finally be brought to fulfillment. God will set up his kingdom and will set up his chosen king. 
And the Bible reveals that this will be the lowliest of all men. It will be Jesus. It will be a worldwide kingdom. Just as the stone of Nebuchadnezzar's dream grew to be a mountain that filled the whole earth. And the kingdom of Jesus will be everlasting. It will be ruled over by the one man who used his free will to choose to always do God's will. Finally, a man who was in God's image and likeness will have dominion over all the earth. And he will use that dominion in the way God intended from the beginning of his creation. But Jesus says this coming king needs people to help establish God's kingdom with him. And God's call to us through Jesus is that, is that he wants you and he wants me to be part of all this. To be those who know God's glory and fill the earth with that knowledge. Remember the lessons God tried to help Nebuchadnezzar to understand. Our creator wants us all to reflect his characteristics, to be in his image and likeness, just as Jesus was and continues to be. <laughs> if we try to do God's will freely, willingly, then the creator promises we can be part of this future that he has wonderfully and graciously planned for the earth. And if we want to be a part of this, remember Jesus encouraged us to pray for it. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth. And Jesus taught his followers to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added to you. And he declared an invitation to all who faithfully trust that God rules in the kingdom of men. Then the king, Jesus, will say to those on his right hand, come you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you on the foundation of the world. And the question is, will you accept this wonderful, gracious invitation? Thank you.